Secret. Fabulous. Welcome to the Breaking the Emotional Eating Habit Masterclass. Uh, if you're ready to be done struggling with food and body challenges, you're absolutely in the right place. Uh, I've got a lot of wonderful information to share with you. And my goal is to make this time with you as valuable, <coughs> excuse me, as I possibly can. So I'm going to invite you, myself included, just to take a minute and make sure you're comfortable, make sure you have whatever you might need to learn, maybe some pencil, paper, um, maybe put away anything that might be a distraction to you, like your phone, mine is going away, even though it's off, I don't even want to know if anyone is around. And um, yeah, so let's really set yourself up for success tonight to be able to take this information in, learn and, and find out what it's really all about. So obviously, if you're here, you probably know me already, but obviously I'm your host, Lori Montre. I'm a trauma-informed eating psychology coach, which means that I help you understand and overcome your challenges with food through the lens of trauma and your nervous system. I am not going to teach you the exact food plan that you need to follow in order to uh, gain freedom. I am not going to teach you how to harness your willpower, right? I'm, I'm here to get you free and to teach you how to develop a nourishing relationship with food. Now I have a whole wall of certifications in behavior change, neuroplasticity, um, somatic experiencing, nervous system regulation, parts work, and a lot more. And while my training and my knowledge is invaluable and very, very important, uh, what makes me a real expert, there we go, in this area is my own 30 year struggle with uh, food and my body. So I, you know, want to just kind of share a little bit of background with you guys about probably 18 years ago or so. I was still struggling with my relationship with food and body every day. Um, at that time, my health was in my, um, my body, my health was getting worse and worse all the time. I had extra weight, digestive issues related to food intolerances and an imbalanced microbiome. I had aches and pains and mood issues. And I remember one day in particular, I was in my kitchen and just feeling Oh, you know, we can get sometimes just so overwhelmed by life, right? It was everything about it. My kids, my, um, my health, my work, all the things, and especially my constant battle with food and body, all of it was just really weighing on me. And I remember going to the refrigerator and taking out about half of a leftover cake. And I remember saying to myself, oh, it's okay to have a couple of bites, but I had no intention of taking a couple of bites right? That was just a trick that I might play with myself in order to uh, allow me to take that cake out and get started with it. So I sat down with the cake, no plate, no attempt to understand why I was about to plow through thousands of calories and tons of sugar. I didn't want to know why, right? I, did, I wanted relief from the overwhelm and the discomfort that I was feeling. And so I went ahead and I started in with the cake and my behavior um, that night, it was, it was horrifying because I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. And I didn't know, um, I didn't know how I would ever stop, right? I knew that I was hurting myself with the food and yet it was the only way I knew how to help myself at the same time. But that time with the cake was just a tiny bit different than the times that I had used food to, to comfort myself and find a sense of peace and relief. And it was different because this time I asked myself a question and that question was so very simple, um, but it was also so relevant that it opened the door to me asking some more questions, which then led to some answers. And that question was, what would it be like to not need this cake right now? And I told you this question was super simple, but it allowed me to see beyond the stuck point that I was in in that moment. And it also allowed me to realize that I needed that cake. I wasn't eating it because I was a gluttonous pig with no willpower. I was meeting a need. Now, granted that the, the cake was a maladaptive way of meeting my needs, but it was meeting my need on some level. 
And recognizing that kind of for the first time started to shift things for me. I still finished half a cake. I still felt sick and guilt-ridden and horribly ashamed of myself, but I had cracked the door open just enough with that simple question to begin to ask more and more questions. And those questions led me on a journey in which I devoured information, courses, and research on the topic of emotional eating. I studied over two years to become a Nuaria Method uh, certified trainer, which is a deep dive into behavior change and neuroplasticity. And I then went on to become a somatic experiencing practitioner and dove into the world of trauma and how it relates to our nervous system and our relationship with food. And as I applied my newly acquired knowledge to my own 30 year dysfunctional relationship with food, I was able to find freedom. And that was something I never imagined, truly never imagined would be possible. I thought best case scenario, I'm going to learn how to control this. I'm going to learn how to manage it and work with it. Right. But instead I actually found freedom, which meant I could trust myself to make food choices that felt aligned with me. I learned how to feel and process my emotions instead of using food to, to cope with them or numb or, or avoid them. And at that point, I knew I needed to leave my career as a lawyer and help as many other people find freedom as I possibly could. And so that's kind of how I got to the place where we are today. And it took me a really long time to overcome my struggles with emotional eating. And I think that a big part of that is that emotional eating is very multifaceted. There's a lot of pieces to it. And if you're not, if you don't have all the pieces on the table, so to speak, at the same time, it's really hard, if, if not impossible, to overcome this challenge. And it's also hard because let's be honest, we have to eat, right? It's not like we can take all the food out of our house and, um, and just swear it off, right? That's not an approach that we can take with respect to food. But I don't want it to take any of you years to achieve freedom. You've been struggling long enough. So I have worked really hard over the last decade to put together um, the, the formula or the program that really does bring together all the different necessary pieces to overcome emotional eating once and for all. And as we start um, the real meat of our conversation tonight, I just want to ask you, you know, why are you here? You could have been doing um, a million other things um, on, a, on a summer evening, you know, but instead you're here with me and the other people that are, that are here live and, and watching the replay. Why are you here? Um, are you here because you want to take charge of your weight, your health, the way you nourish your body? Because you want to feel empowered to make food choices that feel aligned with your overall goals? Is it because you want to eat only when you're hungry? Stop when you feel just right and not think about food all the time. Or maybe it's because you want to be able to feel your emotions, navigate life and stop using food to numb, cope and distract or, or avoid, right? I think you're probably here because you want food and body freedom. And by the end of our time together today, what I really hope to achieve is that number one, you understand that every single thing you have ever done with food makes perfect sense. I hope that you'll understand that willpower and control are not the answer to this challenge. And in fact, it exacerbates your struggle. And the third thing I hope you walk away with tonight is the exact three keys that will allow you to overcome emotional eating for good. So I have a quote that I love to use whenever I'm doing a teaching or, uh, or masterclass. And it's a quote that I came across several years ago. Um, and it goes like this, today me will live in the moment, unless it is unpleasant, in which case me will eat a cookie. And that, of course, is the beloved cookie monster. And that's what this masterclass is all about. It's about breaking the habit of turning to food when the moment is unpleasant. But as you're going to come to understand, it is not a matter of willpower and control. There are deeper and more nuanced reasons why you struggle with food. So that's a great place for us to start. Because um, again, I'll, I'll repeat myself here, but I really want you to understand that everything, everything, everything you've ever done with food, whether it's binge eating, emotional eating, overeating, 
restriction, um, chronic dieting, all of it has a very good reason that's rooted either in your psychology, your physiology, or usually both, right? Now, the roots of emotional eating started for all of us when we were babies, right? You cried and most of the time uh, you were fed, right? And the food soothed you. Swallowing stimulated your vagus nerve and provided a sense of calming relief and comfort. And most likely you were held next to your caregiver's body when you were being fed. And just like that, food meant comfort. In addition to quieting that, that uh, rumbly feeling in, in your tummy, right? And as you grew, there were no doubt times in life when you needed comfort and safety or an escape from difficult emotions or a way to calm a dysregulated nervous system and primed to associate food with comfort, safety, and, and relief, your brain started to use food in order to help you through those times. So simply stated, you learn to associate food with safety, comfort, and relief. Now, here's an added layer that will really help you understand your behavior further. You have a very beautiful and efficient brain that loves to automate things for you, right? So after you had a few experiences where the food helped you in difficult situations, your brain said, okay, let me see if I got this straight. Whenever mom and dad fight, whenever uh, I feel overwhelmed by my schoolwork, whenever I feel like I'm not enough or I get angry and I can't express it or I just don't feel right, food makes me feel a little better. Got it. The next time I encounter that situation or start to feel that emotion, I will automatically take us to the food without bothering you about it, right? Whether or not it's a good idea. Obviously it's a good idea. Why else would we have done it so many times? It's the same thing that you guys experience when you're driving your car, right? You're driving down the road. You're probably, you know, doing other things. You're listening to the radio. You're um, thinking about your day. You might be, you know, talking to someone in the, in the uh, seat next to you. You're, you're probably doing a lot of other things besides just driving. And when you see that yellow light, your foot automatically comes off the gas and goes to the brake, right? And that's something that you do, you, you don't even think about it, right? You're not sitting there going, oh, yellow light. Oh yeah, what is it that I do again? Oh yeah, that's right. I move my foot from the gas to the brake, right? It happens with no thought whatsoever. It's the same thing with food. Every time you repeated the action of using food for some reason other than hunger and, and nourishment, the pathway that was associated with that action became stronger and it allowed you to perform it with, with less and less conscious thought, right? It became so easy to use food in more and more and more situations. So you see your, your challenges with food, they make perfect sense, right? It's logical and kind of brilliant, really. Food has taken care of you in times when you might not have had other skills and tools to help you in that moment. You know, you have needs and sometimes food was, is, the only thing that you have available to you to meet those needs, or at least it seemed that way. So, you know, you may have shown up to this masterclass hoping that I was going to tell you what was wrong with you, or hoping that I was going to teach you how to get rid of and override your bad habits. Um, but the truth is, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you at all. You learned that food could bring much needed distraction from discomfort, can calm stress and overwhelm, it can make you feel safe. And this is a normal and natural human thing to do. So there's nothing wrong with you. However, don't misunderstand that statement. It's not that just because it's normal and natural that you have to keep doing it, right? Um, it kind of works, right? Emotional eating kind of works in the short term. It does make us feel better. It does change our state. But the more long-term effects of emotional eating suck. And I get that, right? The extra weight, the health challenges, the preoccupation with food, the lack of confidence, the feeling out of control, none of that is working for you. And thankfully we're not stuck with our behaviors just because they make sense, just because we have the pathways that are built, we're not stuck with them. 
And so as we now turn our attention a little bit to the solutions for these challenges, I just want to make sure that you guys understand that you're human, you're normal, natural, your brain is doing exactly what it was created to do, build pathways. Um, and, and so there's nothing wrong with you. And that's a really important thing to remember. So let's shift our focus a little bit to started talking about solutions. And I wanna just start by saying what is not a solution. Um, let's see, Vita, thank you for your comment. It says, it's so true. I notice thinking about food when something very distressing happens. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think we could probably all relate to that experience. But I wanna really highlight for you guys and, and help you understand why willpower and control are not the answer to this challenge. You know, I'm willing to bet that every single one of us here has tried to solve our or fix our food problems, right, um, through restriction. And if you're anything like me, you may have tried hundreds of different plans and diets to get it together and stop out of control eating. And I'll just ask the question, how's that working for you? I know the answer to the question because you wouldn't be here if it was working. And some people will say, well, no, no, it does work because when I'm able to restrict, I lose weight. But the truth of the matter is if it doesn't work long-term, it, it's not working period, right? So restriction can work for a time, whether it's a day, a week, a month, or in some cases, you know, a year, but it's simply not sustainable because restriction is going to go against every ounce of your primal programming. And for that reason, and because it doesn't actually meet the real underlying need, it's going to backfire. It's going to fail you 99% of the time. And this is really infuriating because we've been told for decades that emotional eating and overeating, it's a result of a deficit in willpower, right? We've been told that overeating is the problem that needs a solution. We've heard it from the media who sells us through their advertisements, all the solutions to the country's weight problems. We've heard it from our doctors who tell us that, you know, our health problems are the result of extra weight. We should eat less, move more, right? We've heard it from our family and friends who want the best for us. And the messages come packaged in many different forms, but the basic theme is that overeating and excess weight means there's something wrong with us. And the answer to our problem lies in learning to control ourselves and win the battle with food. But all of this, all of these things, these are lies because overeating is not the actual problem. Overeating is the signal. It's the symptom. It's the result of the actual problems. So undesired behaviors with food are in fact a signal that you have unmet needs. These needs may be emotional, spiritual, um, mental, physical, and the overeating is not gonna go away until those needs start to get met. So trying to tackle your food challenges with willpower and control only add to the difficulty for two reasons. First of all, it doesn't actually address the underlying need which means you're constantly left trying to rely on unreliable willpower. And secondly, restriction fuels out of control behavior. It doesn't solve it. And this, you know, overeating or binge eating as a result of restriction is a really simple, explainable and scientifically studied reaction. It's a survival mechanism of your incredible brain. A restrictive mindset, meaning whether you actually restrict or not, is met by the brain as a threat. Your brain doesn't care whether the famine is real or whether it's, it's possible. So restriction or, or a restrictive mindset is going to cause you to seek out high, um, high calorie foods, densely calorically dense foods in, in large amounts to help you survive the perceived famine that your brain is convinced is on the way. Right? And this is a normal symptom of a healthy brain. I mean, think about this concept, right? Isn't it true that whatever is forbidden is more appealing? Isn't it true that what we resist persists? Right? Think about for yourself, when you have restricted or when you believe restriction is coming up, what is the result? When you know the diet starting on Monday, what's the weekend look like? Right? And that is your brilliant hunting and gathering brain telling you um, that, that this is how you're going to survive that famine. 
right? Everybody, everybody knows all about that. So not only does willpower and restriction fuel the scarcity mindset, it also ignores what's happening for you inside, doesn't it? What you're actually needing. And when I think about this, this is one of the, this is one of the really hard things, one of the really sad things when I think about this challenge, because here you are, um, like I was, you know, someone who's hurting and struggling in the moment when you're feeling triggered to eat. And instead of showing up for ourselves, we slap our hands and criticize ourselves, right? And this is such a lonely and difficult place to be. You either manage to avoid the food and end up feeling terrible, or you give into the food and you end up feeling terrible. So if you can take, you know, one thing away from our time together tonight, I just really want it to be that in those moments when you feel triggered to eat, you have needs in that moment. And if just like I did that day with the cake, right, there was a need present there. And if we can recognize this and stop denying ourselves comfort and care in those moments, that's how we're going to be successful. We're going to be successful when we stop fighting ourselves and get really curious about the underlying needs and what they are and how we can meet them. This is one of the reasons why so many approaches to end emotional eating fail because they're centered around control instead of meeting your needs. Working with yourself is always going to lead to better success than, than fighting against yourself. So at the, at the risk of repeating myself and, and boring you guys, I just really want to drive this home. You know, your urges to overeat are driven by powerful physiological and psychological triggers that are not overcome through force and struggle. There's always a good reason why we humans do what we do with food and learning what those reasons are is the key to changing your relationship with food because until those needs are met, um, and efforts are being made to, to understand your needs and, and to meet them, not perfectly, but well enough, the urges to overeat actually serve a really valuable purpose. They can be overcome or overpowered for brief periods of time through restriction and control, but it's not going to be on any consistent or long-term basis. You've probably experienced that in your life. I know I certainly did. So when you stop putting all of your focus and energy and power into fighting against yourself and put that into figuring out what do I need, then you can solve the problem instead of covering it up. Now, some of your needs may be really obvious and some of them may be a little bit harder to identify, but they all boil down to essentially three main needs. And these are the three main pillars of the Freedom from Emotional Eating program. And so the next part of the masterclass is I'm going to explain what those three keys are. But before we do that, I just want to take a moment and open it up and see, first of all, get your guys's reaction. Is this material, is it making sense to you? Am I doing a good job of helping you understand why everything you do with food makes sense and how willpower and control are not the answer? I'd love to get, get your feedback. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Velda. Yeah. And those of you on, on the replay, as you're watching it, you know, really take a moment just to reflect on, on this information. Thanks, Patricia. Yeah. I also want to invite you to check in with your body. What is your body saying about this information? Maybe you want to take a second and close your eyes and, and check in. You know, one person might be feeling a sense of um, maybe some relief and some excitement about the fact, what, I'm not broken? I'm not, what, I, my brain is working as it's supposed to be? That's amazing. Maybe somebody else is feeling um, grief for all the times that they, you know, without maybe realizing it, just wasn't attuned to the needs that they were feeling. And that feels maybe a little bit sad. Thank you, Georgia. Yeah, definitely. Georgia says, and, and maybe some fear. Yeah. And I, I get that a lot. And man, did I ever hear, uh, did I ever experience that myself? Um, if this was me 20 years ago, say I would have heard this information and I would have shut down to the person to, talking this way. Um, not that I, I honestly, there wasn't a whole lot of this kind of conversation that I ran across, but anytime I heard any inkling of give up willpower, control, restriction, 
oh man, I did not want any part of that. That's usually the time I might, you know, um, get up and say, yep, yeah, no, nope, that wasn't for me because it felt like that was the only safe place there was. And I really, um, you know, so that feeling, it might be a barrier and, um, that just, you know, kind of holds the, the, the information away because it truly doesn't feel safe. And that's actually one of the things that sometimes we have to work on initially is being a little bit open and uh, to, to the idea that maybe we'll uh, control and willpower are not the answer. And one of the really beautiful things that I love about the work that I do is um, I don't need to, to force you into that space. Right? I don't need to, we can work with wh wherever you are. And if you're not ready to let go of your control and willpower, I am not going to help you by, by pushing you into to that space. Because right now food is like a life preserver for us, right? Um, it is the way that we are navigating and getting through the world. So if you feel like you can't swim, right? And, and your life preserver, whether it's food or whether it's control and restriction, whatever your life preserver is, if I come along in my boat and say, okay, hand it over, give me the life preserver, we're done with that thing. You're, you're not going to benefit from that, right? You are going to be incredibly fearful. You're going to hang on to that thing for dear life, right? And we're going to get nowhere. So rather than taking that approach, it always makes more sense to learn how to swim first before you go into the, the areas that, that feel like too much, you know, so we learn how to swim. We, um, you know, we, we hold on to the life preserver with both hands, but with our body out of, of the water and, and, and learn how to kick. And, and then we, you know, start to, to hang on maybe with one hand and, and we work our way there because um, just going all in and, and trying to rip that away is, is never going to work. So, yeah, thanks for sharing about, about um, what you're experiencing right now makes sense to me. And I feel a bit, a bit less hard on myself. Yes. That is a great place to be. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Well, let me then, what I really want to dive into now is the three keys that I have found are the most essential. Um, you, you can't overcome emotional eating without these keys. And even though we're going to talk about them separately and kind of look at them in their individual uh, and have individual conversations about them, they are so interdependent that I don't want to misrepresent that they are, uh, that any one of them can be at play without the other ones. They're completely interdependent. They are always showing up together. Although for any individual, it might be that um, one is more important than the other, or in any particular situation, one might be more important than the other, but they, all three of them are always at play. So let me, um, let me start with key number one. Key number one, we've already touched on a little bit, and that is your habituated brain. So have you ever heard the phrase, what fires together, wires together? What this phrase means is, again, as we spoke about earlier, your beautiful efficiency seeking brain creates a strong neurological pathway for our behaviors, right? And when we repeat a behavior over time, it gets easier and easier to perform every time you do it. This is especially true when our behavior has a reward of some kind, like the dopamine hit that we get when we eat food. So you can think of our neurological pathways kind of like the, the um, old wagon train ruts. That, that we saw going across the country in the late 1800s. You know, we had a lot of rain, a lot of mud, and a lot of wagons. So what would happen is they would uh, create these deep, deep grooves in the ground. And once your wagon got stuck in those grooves, it was really hard to get out of it, right? And that's very similar to the way our brain works. Once a pathway has been established in our brain, such as the pathway for turning to food, for emotional reasons, once that pathway gets, uh, gets uh, developed, your habituated brain, it says, you know, oh, here's the, that situation, or here's that emotion. Don't worry about this, Lori. I know exactly what we need to do. I'm going to take us straight to the kitchen, straight for the food. You don't even need to worry about this. I got this right. You, you just go about your business. You can just check out if you want, because I know exactly what to do. Right. The brain thinks it's doing us such a big favor 
because we taught it, right? That this was a good thing to do. And at that point, it's so easy to eat. So, so easy. And in fact, it feels impossible not to, right? So your challenges with emotional eating are in large part due to the habituated pathways of your efficiency seeking brain. Now, as we were wrapping up the last section, I also said, you know, emotional eating is about meeting your needs. So how does this relate to your habituated brain? Sometimes the need that you are satisfying through the food is calming the urge to emotionally eat because you have a strong impulse driving you to do so out of habit. Okay, if that makes sense. And this is something that sometimes people will be really confused because they might say, yeah, yeah, sometimes I get it. Like sometimes I notice I'm feeling overwhelmed and or stressed and I turn to food, but sometimes I don't even know what's going on, right? I'm, I'm just sitting back wondering, why did I eat all the popcorn? Why did I eat four cookies? Um, why did I order the nachos when I wasn't hungry? Nothing was going on for me, but I did it anyway, right? And Sometimes, you know, in those cases, there might be an underlying need that's just kind of uh, a little bit hidden and we need to, to do some work to try to drive that out. But sometimes there are definitely times when the need that you are meeting is just a quieting of that urge that's brought on by habituated pathways. And this is why it's crucial to learn how to work with your brain to build new pathways right? We don't win by fighting old pathways. We win by establishing new pathways so that you're not stuck going down the same well-worn pathway with no alternative in sight. The well-worn pathway, it's only your default system. But when you can stay conscious through the help of your higher brain or your prefrontal cortex, you can override the default system and be able to make intentional choices that feel good in the moment and feel good later too. So your higher brain, which is something that we're gonna talk a lot more about because it is such a big part of this, um, this whole picture, but your higher brain has access to your long-term goals. It has access to your creativity, your problem solving, it's really the part of your brain that can pull your hand back from the pantry door when habituated brain is screaming, eat the chips, eat them now, right? Your higher brain can come in and say, oh, wait a minute, Let, let's step back here a second. But the reality is that most of us are not living, most of us, all of us, not just people who struggle with emotional eating, because as you know, there are so many people struggling with so many unwanted behaviors. And part of the reason is that a lot of us are not connected to our higher brain much of the time. Instead, we live in our lower or our survival brain as a result of constant stimulation, stress, worry, um, our past experiences. And survival brain, you know, it's very different from our higher brain. Survival brain is really only concerned about the next two minutes only and getting you out of whatever discomfort you may be feeling as quickly as possible. Survival brain always takes the easiest route. Survival brain is a creature of habit. But thanks to neuroplasticity, we can intentionally rewire the brain to create wanted habits and, and unwanted habits by engaging with the higher brain and bringing conscious intention to your behavior, building new pathways. And we have an abundant amount of research that shows us how to do this, how to work with your brain instead of fighting it in order to build habits that serve you better. And in the program, we dive deep into the tools and the strategies that help you reconnect with higher brain, because again, this is how you're able to stand inside those urges, recognize them as urges, and then, you know, be able to choose to meet your need in a way that doesn't involve food. And believe it or not, it absolutely can be done if you've not experienced it. It only makes sense that your brain says, mm, I'm not sure how that works. I'm not sure that's possible for me, right? That was a big one for me. I always thought, yeah, well, that might work for some people, but that is not going to work for me. But with, with the right tools and strategies, it's absolutely possible for all of us. We know that our brains are plastic. So that is one of the biggest keys right there is working with the habituated brain. Now, the next key is 
healing past traumas, and learning to regulate your nervous system. And this is such a missing key, such a missing component in um, certainly in, in working to overcome challenges with food, but also just in the addiction world, in, in the world in general. And we're starting to see more and more information, um, more and more people uh, looking at the nervous system and understanding its importance, which is really wonderful. Um, but we're a long way from being there. Um, but the nervous system is, is so central to overcoming challenges of, of all kinds. You know, and I learned this um, kind of in stages, but early on in my practice, I had two groups of people, essentially. I had the, the group of people who were taking the tools and practices that I was teaching, um, able to implement them and having awesome success. Their relationship with food was changing. They were losing weight and, and opening up to, to a whole new life. And then I had a group of people who really wanted change, but they couldn't get themselves to use the tools consistently. Nobody was in the middle. And of course, those people, as you can imagine, were staying stuck. Nobody was in the middle of saying, hey, I'm using the tools. They're just not working for me. That wasn't happening at all. So because of this data, because of the work I had done with myself, I knew I had the right tools. I knew I had the right system. And I really believed that if the people who couldn't, for whatever reason, get themselves to use the tools consistently, if they could, that they would find success as well. And so I set about trying to figure out what's going on with this group of people that make it hard for them to consistently integrate the tools and practices. If I had asked them what was going on, they would have told me, oh, uh, I have no willpower. Uh, I'm too broken. I'm a loser, you know, or some other lie. Um, but of course, I didn't believe that. And that's when I took a deeper dive into the world of trauma, the nervous system, and all things somatic. And what I learned was that the reason why so many of these people could not get themselves to integrate the work was because their systems were in overwhelm. They were living in survival and literally had no more, nothing to give. They had no capacity for the work that, that I was offering. And so starting with their nervous systems first, helping them heal from trauma, giving them back capacity, helping them to re-engage with their higher brain was the foundation they needed to be able to use the tools consistently. And as they did that, they also um, were able to find success and overcome their challenges with food. So if you've been struggling with emotional eating or other behaviors for a long time, and you're wondering what's going on, I really want you to hear this. There's nothing wrong with you. Again, there, you may be living in survival mode. And when we're in survival mode, we stay stuck in our unwanted patterns. Um, as, again, to go back to kind of that understanding of, of higher brain versus survival brain, when our nervous systems are dysregulated, we shut down access. We lose access to our higher brain and survival brain takes over. And while this is a great system when our survival is actually at stake, it leads us to make choices that really don't serve us in the long run. So I just really, because this is so important, I really wanna take a few moments to just kind of contrast the difference between higher brain and survival brain. So survival brain, as I said, it is focused on your survival the next two minutes only. Even that might be quite a stretch in the next 30 seconds only, right? Survival brain does not care how you're going to feel about anything in 15 minutes. It just wants to make sure you're alive in 15 minutes. So when you're having a triggered moment and you feel like you can't handle what's going on for you, survival brain makes split second decisions. It knows food has worked well in the past to deal with these kinds of emergencies. And so it sends you straight to food without a second to lose, without even a second to ask or to, to make an evaluation, right? So contrast this with higher brain. Higher brain sees what's happening, sees what your needs are, and, and can meet your needs in creative ways that take into account your long-term goals. Survival brain says, hey, take the pathway that's already here, eat for Christ's sake, you know, since survival brain only has access to this moment right here, it just assumes that the pain 
the urge, all of it, it's going to stay here indefinitely until you eat. It doesn't imagine that, that you'll ever get out of this unless you eat in that moment. But higher brain has the ability to say, okay, okay, hey, hang on a second here. Maybe there's a better way. Let's just slow down for a few minutes and, and think this through. Higher brain can offer solutions that feel aligned with your goals. Survival brain, you know, is just completely overwhelmed. It has no capacity for anything other than what is quick and easy, right? So uh, survival brain is also very easily triggered. Everything feels really, really hard. It feels like just such a big deal. Whereas higher brain is resilient. It can see the bright side of things. It has a much more optimistic view of life. Bottom line is survival brain emotionally eats and higher brain can meet your needs in more creative ways. And as I mentioned, survival brain is really a function of a dysregulated nervous system. So that's why we need to put time, attention, and focus on learning how to communicate with and understand our nervous system if we're going to be able to operate and, and do life, navigate life from our higher brains. So by working with the system first, right? Before we dive into the tools and practices, we want to start everything from a well-regulated, healthy nervous system. And this has been such a missing piece for so many people who have said, oh my God, I tried everything and nothing worked until I learned how to work with my nervous system. It really is the foundation upon which all the other work can actually take place. Um, instead of, you know, spinning our wheels and trying the same things over and over, we first have to connect with that higher version of ourselves and gain some capacity. Um, in the freedom program that is actually open for enrollment right now and is beginning on the 15th of, of July, I teach several modalities in the course for learning about your nervous system and, and working with it. Um, because right now, you know, the fact of the matter is to some degree, you are turning to food to regulate your nervous system. And, you know, food, as I said, it stimulates your vagus nerve, it um, affects your brain chemistry, and it's doing an okay job of regulating your nervous system. But if you want to stop using food to regulate your system, you've got to find something that works better. The answer is never going to be to tell the survival system, no, you don't need anything right now. Don't worry about that threat you're, you're feeling. Uh, you can just ignore this feeling of danger, right? We, we're not uh, meant to win against our survival system. We just aren't engineered to do that. And that's probably a good thing. Um, so we're gonna meet the need that's there. And one of the needs, in addition to calming those urges of the habituated brain is to regulate our system. So I want to want to just ask you guys, you know, can you imagine how much different life might feel if you weren't running from tigers all day long? How much different would it feel to be resourced and capable instead of just trying to survive the day? Yeah. Imagine how your eating habits would change if you felt calm, alive, and resourced. Yeah. And I really hope that you're starting to get um, a clear picture of what it takes to, to end emotional eating and take back your control with respect to food and really start nourishing your body because weight loss and health and, and vitality are the natural consequence of this healthy relationship. So we can move into then the third key and the third need that we're trying to meet when we're reaching for food. And this third key is all about emotional resiliency. So it's very likely um, that all of you here and all of you watching on the replay um, turn to food when you feel uncomfortable emotions, like I did. You know, and most of us, we were never taught how to honor or, or hear, allow, process our emotions, right? In fact, we probably weren't told anything at all about our emotions. Maybe we were told we shouldn't get emotional or to always look on the bright side whenever something was upsetting. But most often we're not told anything at all about our intense emotions or, or how to navigate them. Even the most well-intentioned caregivers often don't have the, the knowledge or the skills to help us learn how to do that. 
So most people learn how to, or try to deal with difficult emotions by just trying to get rid of them, push them away and, and get rid of them as quickly as possible, right? The idea of simply being with your emotions, allowing them to pass through on their own, that is a very foreign concept to, to most. And even if people can kind of grasp the concept, we certainly don't know how to do it. So when emotions seem too big to handle or feel really uncomfortable, they can, in addition to dysregulating our nervous system, um, they can, you know, really take us over and make us feel like, you know, searching for something outside of us to help us deal with that. And most often um, that something is food. So if we want to end emotional eating, we've got to stop pushing down our emotions and stop trying to simply make them go away. Um, your emotions are your guidance system, right? They're, they are how you navigate life in a safe way. And emotions are energy. They have to be metabolized or discharged. And when we hold the energy of our emotions in our body, we experience illness, right? That's the work of Gabor Mate in his book, um, When the Body Says No. Um, it's We experience illness, addiction, nervous system dysregulation, and many other challenges. So denying or stuffing emotions, you know, it's also very, very harmful to our psyche, right? Imagine if a sweet child came to you and said, I need help. I'm hurting. Please help me. And you said, here, cookies, you deal with her. I don't know what to do. I don't know what she needs. You know, you, you, you figure it out. Right. And that's what we do to the parts of us that are often hurting and, and scared and needing something. We hand those parts over to the food, the wine, the, you know, whatever coping mechanism that we're, that we're using in the moment. So this third key to overcoming unwanted patterns and behaviors is to make friends with our emotions. And this doesn't apply only to food. It applies to all kinds of things that, that people struggle with. And it's, it's really about learning how to sit in those uncomfortable, those unpleasant moments like Cookie Monster described and, and being able to, to navigate them. Um, ultimately, the way to change your relationship with food is to change the, your relationship with your emotions. Um, in the course, I offer a lot of powerful tools and practices very specifically for exploring your emotional world in a way that is safe and effective. Um, in reality, learning to ride the waves of your emotions is kind of like learning to surf. Um, you know, your emotions can feel like giant life-threatening waves, but with the right skills and the right equipment, you can learn to surf those emotions rather than being taken over or, or knocked over by them. So, I mean, just imagine for a second being able to navigate you know, whatever it is for you, shame, guilt, loneliness, boredom, not enoughness, stress, overwhelm, anxiety, anxiety, without needing food or anything else to help you cope with it. Um, that's powerful and, and it's absolutely possible. So these are the three keys that we need to overcome emotional eating. We need to learn how to work with our habituated pathways, regulate our nervous system so that we can operate from higher brain rather than survival brain and learn to surf our emotions rather than being knocked out by them. So maybe you can start to see now how you might have been putting your time and energy into unhelpful methods. Control and willpower are not the answer. Um, and if you've been wasting your resources trying to change your behavior with these approaches, you have every right to feel exhausted and frustrated. But if you are ready to put time and energy into these three keys, I know you can make real and permanent change. So there may be some of you um, here or watching the replay that are feeling ready and want to hear a little bit about what is the, the freedom program. And so I'd love to take, before we open it up to questions, I'd love to take three, five minutes, something like that, and just tell you a little bit about what it is. And, and what it entails. Um, this program is, is I'm, I'm really proud of it because I, I know that it's um, very effective and it is something that uh, really brings together 
all of those pieces that, that I've been talking about and all the pieces that are all in one place so that it is, is a comprehensive solution. The first thing um, that it provides is a 16 module course that's um, an online course um, for you to dive into. Every module has a series of videos which teaches the topic of the week. And I will say too that everything in this program is very bite-sized. It's, it's designed um, so that you don't have to spend hours and hours every week on the material. I have learned probably the hard way that I can give you all the best information in the world, but if I don't give it to you in a way that you can assimilate it and, and take it in, that information is, is pointless to you. So I tried really hard to um, create something that, that is that, that bite size. So in any given week, you know exactly what you're working on and it is something that can fit into your schedule. Um, there's also a full integration workbook. So every module has integration work and practices which help you take the knowledge that you learn in the video and then apply it to your life, your circumstances, your challenges. And this is really crucial because knowledge is necessary and it is awesome, but by itself, it doesn't lead to a new set of circumstances, right? You have all read a book or taken a program or done a, a course, something, and then a month later, you're like, what was that even about? right? It just, the integration of it didn't happen. And that is so central um, to the work. And so the, the practices and the tools that you build on over time are really designed to help you learn it and then bring it into your life. Um, there's also the full somatic library, which is one of the most powerful ways that you can learn how to regulate your nervous system, how to communicate, learn that information about the, the nervous system. The library includes 40 exercises in an experiential way. So I'm going through the exercise with you. And that really is, um, you know, learning by doing with respect to somatic experiencing is really the easiest way to build a practice of your own. And there are many bonus materials, meditations, and practices for dealing with triggers. Um, there is a one uh, bonus video in particular that you can watch while you're actually in a triggered moment with food. And done consistently, that's how we can build a new pathway. And so that you're not stuck going down that same wagon train, um, right? We're going to build a new path for you, one that's consistent with, with the goals and, and the person that you want to be. Um, there's weekend track tracking sheets so that you always know exactly where you are in the program and what you need to be focusing on from week to week. So these are the inclusions. This is the program itself. And then another really important part is the support piece. And that comes through live coaching every week for 17 weeks. So the program is 16 weeks and we take a week, a, a module a week, um, but our first week together is you're not expected to, to show up doing anything. So it's 17 total weeks of meetings. And this is the part that I really love so much for myself and for the students, because having been in the coaching world for a long time, both as the coach and the coacher, I know that people who have live real support and guidance and accountability they do way better than those um, without that, especially a program like this, where it's really meant to help you establish a sense of safety um, and support. And uh, I will say that, you know, one of the things I love most about the meetings is we all show up to this space, no matter, you know, we've read about it. We, we know that the other people are struggling. Otherwise, why would there be uh, YouTube videos, a billion YouTube videos on emotional eating? Why would there be programs? Why would there be books, right? We know other people are struggling, but for some reason, we still believe we're the only ones who do these things. You know, and so when you show up to the group and somebody else is sharing the experience you had last week, you're like, oh my God, I'm, I'm really not the only one. And then you start to build compassion for that person. And through that, you learn how to build the compassion for, for yourself. So it's a really beautiful process that, that I love being a part of. Um, every meeting is, is recorded and then housed in the course portal. So you have access to that meeting, even if you can't be there live. You can still watch the meeting. You can send in your question so that I can address it for the replay. So, you know, meeting um, or getting to every single meeting live is not something that, that is required. 
Um, and I keep these groups very, very small by industry standards. I've been part of and have mentored in very large groups of you know, 500 people or more. And while they have their use and, and certainly not uh, a bad thing, I really believe that this kind of um, challenge, I really need to be able to, to know you and to be able to, um, to you know, know what your challenges look like and understand that if I'm going to be able to, to guide you. So keep these groups to um, 30 or less. You know, and there are some people occasionally will say, you know, the group just really isn't for me, or um, there's just no way I could ever meet and make any of those meeting times. And I do offer the program a la carte, meaning without the, the group coaching, although um, I do think the group coaching is amazing, but you can still get support um, through one-on-one -on -one calls if that is um, the, the route that seems to fit you better. And that can be done, you know, personalized to your schedule. So whether you choose a group coaching option or going through the program on your own with the one-on-one, -on -one, there is um, what you need to really create lasting change when, and with your relationship with food and, and in your life. So I would just really, at this point, you know, invite you guys to all just, you know, be open your heart to the idea of, of really diving into this challenge and, and really being done with it once, once and for all. Um, as I open it up for questions now, I just wanna say, you know, I shared a lot with you guys and some of these concepts may be new. You may take this information and, and uh, you know, kind of roll it around and, and you may come up with some, some questions that, that are not on your mind right now. And I know that there are gonna be many of you watching the replay. Um, and didn't have a chance to ask me your questions live. So I've created a space for us next Thursday at this same time at six o'clock mountain, where we'll get together again, um, just for the purpose of answering the questions that people have thought of throughout the week. Um, and finally, I will also mention that I've opened up um, a few slots on my calendar for discovery calls for anybody who says, you know what, I am, I am ready. I'm really ready to invest in myself and to, um, and, and to do this work, but I just want to make sure that the freedom program is, is the best fit for me to do that. So if that's you, um, I'm going to have the link to sign up for a discovery call and, and, and we can, um, get on that on that call and just talk about what what your needs are and whether or not it would be a good fit. So with all of that, I want to open it up for questions. And I also want to congratulate you for showing up here for listening for learning with me. It's always such a pleasure, um, a gift really for me to be able to to share my life's work. So I'm looking forward to um, answering your questions, to spending time with some of you over the next couple of weeks, and hopefully into to welcoming many of you into the, the Freedom from Emotional Eating course, which is, again, starting on July 15th. So um, I'd love to hear your questions, your thoughts, anything that, that you would like to share or be willing to share. Oh, one more thing I did want to mention, too, is... I'm going to put the link to, to the information to the sign up page for the program. And in the sign up page, um, there are a number of testimonials from people who have recently finished um, the Freedom Program. I have a lot more than, than our, I can put up on that page. But, you know, I asked the question to people, you know, if you could give some advice to somebody who was in your shoes four months ago, you know, when you were in that space wondering, should I sign up? For the freedom program and i think that um you know hearing their responses and and just kind of um just for the purpose of you know do you recognize yourself in in them and and do what they have to say um is it something that you that you find useful yeah so those are on the the information page the sign up page for the for the program all right well let's Let's open it up for questions then, or comments, anything at all. We don't have to have any, of course. Oh yes, thank you, Georgia. The cost is these um, meetings are, are once a week. Um, the cost for the program and the meetings is 1297. 
which I'm super excited about. It's, um, you know, I, I consider if you, I really encourage everyone to do research on their own um, about the cost, because when you put that live component in there, um, just for example, I, I was checking out a program that I'm really interested in um, yesterday on the internet, and this is a 12 module course. And it's course only. So there's no contact, human contact whatsoever. The course is 12, uh, almost uh, 2300, 2297. And that's very typical. Like that didn't blow me away. I was like, yeah, that's kind of what I would expect. Um, I really do try to um, work with the price because I don't want to serve just one group of, of the population. I really want it to be accessible to everybody who's needing it. And so. Um, I feel great about that, but, but do your research and, and, and see, yeah. And Patricia, I know you're, you're here and, and the, the, this class would be a little bit different in that instead of two a week, it's, it's one a week, just in case you're, um, wondering about that. Yeah. So yeah, for anybody who is learning, interested in learning more, I'm going to put this replay out. I'm going to include the link for the uh, information for the sign up page. I'm going to include the link for um, also for the discovery call in case it would be helpful to you to, you know, be able to have that uh, personal space. Those are going to be one uh, first come first serve. So I don't know exactly how many I've opened up, however many I could fit in between now and, and uh, July 15th. But if it is, you are interested in, I would encourage you to sign up um, on the earlier side. And also, as you know, um, as I mentioned, it, it is going to be limited to 30 people. I, I could consider uh, creating a second time if we get more than that, but your class would be, would be limited in, to that number. Yeah. Well, like I said, it's a lot to take in in one shot. So that's why I always like to provide that second um, opportunity to come and ask questions. And certainly for all of my replay watchers, I just again want to say thanks for spending time with me. I really love sharing this information because it's so exciting. And even if, you know, you say to yourself, you know, now's not my time, which, which I, I wonder about, right. Cause I told myself, um, so many times now's not the time or, you know, no, I, I should be able to do it myself. That was a big, um, a, a big thing for me. So, um, yeah, if, if that's you, you know, hopefully you took away something from tonight and, and it moved you a little closer to, to, to finding that um, compassion for yourself. Brenda asks, is asking any tips to deal with that sense of lost time? Yeah, that sense of lost time, I assume you're, you're talking about, and I can definitely relate to the idea that, um, you know, I, as I said, I spent 30 years, right, inside this struggle. So that sense of now, um, you know, but kind of almost like, what a shame, right, that I spent so much time uh, going around and around on that same hamster wheel, instead of actually um, putting in the knowing what the, what the answer was and putting time and energy into that. And, you know, a couple things come to mind. One thing is, you know, when I wake up in the morning now and have for, for many years now, um, when I wake up in the morning, um, and, and have the realization that I don't have to fight with myself about food and that, that I don't have to feel shame or guilt um, that I'm healthy in, in a right size body for me and, and all of those things. It is such a, a sense of joy and such a gift that it almost makes it feel like, you know, all the years that when I woke up in the morning thinking, oh my God, why did I eat that yesterday? How am I going to control myself today? All of the years spent there, you might say wasted or that lost time there. I think this time in life gets to be so sweet and so joy filled because 
there was that time too, right? So yeah, it seems like a disappointment, but at the same time, I don't think I could feel the joy and the freedom, you know, of now having not gone through that. So I think that that's a big part of it. And, you know, um, there's there in the, and for me, there was a reason, right? There was a reason why uh, there's nothing you can tell me that you have ever done with food that I wouldn't get. Right. So all of that, it, I think it's for a purpose and, and when you're ready and can move and shift out of that and step into your freedom, um, that sense of lost time is, is going to fall away. You're going to be too busy enjoying, um, the freedom and, and the, you know, relate new relationship with yourself. So that's my, that's my thought on, on the lost time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The course is the perfect example of making my mess, my message. Yeah, exactly. And, and I've thought that so many times, you know, and people will share that with me, um, you know, as they're describing their feelings or their, um, you know, their challenge, I say, yeah, I, I get it <laughs> because I do, <laughs> because I, I spent time there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I hope we're leaving here tonight with a real sense of, of belief in yourself. Yeah. Because I a hundred percent believe that with the right tools and um, commitment there, there absolutely is a solution for you. Yeah. And Hello, let's see. Um, I don't want to mispronounce your name. Is it Ryan? R-Y-N just joining us. Hello. Um, we're just wrapping up, but the good news is I did remember to record. So I'm going to be sending out the full replay of our time tonight so that you can watch it. And I'll just remind, um, remind us and, and tell you too that um, there's a, a space next Thursday uh, at the same time, six o'clock mountain um, for, for you to come and join and answer, ask any questions that you might have after watching the replay. Yeah, awesome. Okay, ladies, thank you for, for being here and for sharing time with me. I will very much look forward to next week. Let's see, I have, uh, let's see, Anna is joining. Hello, Anna, we are just wrapping up. We started at Six Mountain tonight. Oh my, we're, I wonder if there was confusion about the, the timing, but sometimes I think people may not be as familiar with m mountain and sometimes get get that confused. But for those of you just joining, just wanted to mention we just wrapped up. And so but no, no need to worry, because I am going to be sending out the recording um, of our full time together. And that way you can participate and watch the replay. And then I have a space open for us next Thursday, to come back and ask questions next Thursday at six mountain. So whatever time zone you're in, if you're signing in right now, it's seven mountain. Um, so this time an hour earlier is when we will hold that Q and A session. Unless any of you have a, a question right now, I would be more than happy um, to answer it. Okay. So everybody just signing on, did that make sense that we might have just had the, the wrong time zone? Next week will be again at Six Mountain. Okay, thank you guys. It was great being with you. And I will look forward. Um, yes, I'll send the links with the replay. Anna, good to see you. Thanks for being here, even though the timing wasn't wasn't on. It's always nice to see you. All right, ladies. Good night. I look forward to seeing you all soon. Bye-bye.